Okay, well, uh, good, nearly good afternoon, just about. Uh, my name is Daniel Gunshaitan. I'm chair of the, in the program in public health um, here at UC Irvine. Uh, I'm very delighted to welcome you all to the first in our seminar series for the academic year. We did have one last week, but we didn't host that one. So we will be having these uh, seminars here uh, in the auditorium. I think it's very good space. Uh, I know that they have some acoustic things integrated into the hall, but um, that means that your, click your clicking on your laptops it will probably carry. So uh, any small sound will be uh, heard all around the hall. So please, uh, let's uh, be a little bit quiet. Uh, the other thing is I know some of us uh, generally have to leave early because of um, classes after the seminar. I'd urge you to wait until 1. I'm sure you'll be okay uh, moving to the next classroom. That's part of why we pick the central location. So please exercise patience. Uh, let's wait till the speaker's done and questions are, uh, most of the questions are answered. The other uh, thing is we uh, make opportunities available for uh, students, faculty, uh, staff, anyone interested in, in the topic or in public health in general uh, to meet with the speaker at a lunch that we host after the presentation. That will be just about three minutes walk from here in the Public Health Program building, uh, 653 East Peltasin Drive. It's uh, an ether instruction and research building. It's just across uh, from the engineering gateway, the ne next building over. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, this entire series is recorded. Uh, videotaped and uh, made available to a wider audience through the Open Courseware program. This is an award-winning program that UC Irvine started a few years ago. And thank you for uh, the support that they have provided and the staff that make this possible every week. So it's indeed my great pleasure to introduce and welcome back to UC Irvine campus, Dr. Deborah uh, Mindry. She um, got her uh, PhD here in anthropology, and I know that there are anthropologists in the audience. Um, we've had uh, great collaborations with that department as we build public health here at UC Irvine. So um, she uh, originally uh, hails from South Africa, uh, getting her bachelor's degree uh, from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And then she came here, as I mentioned, for the PhD in anthropology and has since um, gone to UCLA uh, with the Global Health Program there and now a Center for Culture and Health, which I believe is affiliated with the Department of Neuroscience. Uh, she's interested in, in gender politics, non-governmental organizations and development, and on HIV uh, AIDS syndrome. Uh, she's conducted qualitative ethnographic research in South Africa since the early 1990s. And she's done a lot of work in other countries in Africa as well, uh, Malawi, Uganda, and in the United States. So please join me to welcome Dr. Mindri as she discusses with us reproductive choices and challenges for uh, planning uh, for H HIV. Oops. Yeah. That way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dele and uh, Brandon, for inviting me to come and speak back here. It's wonderful to be back at my home school. And I was just saying to them, it's amazing how dramatically it has changed over the years uh, from when I was a student here. <laughs> anyway, so today I'm here to talk about my work on uh, reproductive choices and challenges for people living with HIV. Um, my work on HIV, I really got drawn into it because of my work on gender politics in South Africa. Um, 
I had done a lot of research on gender identity issues and across different races, but as the HIV epidemic took such a large front stage in South Africa, I found myself shifting towards looking at the effects of HIV. And while I was conducting um, ethnographic work and some qualitative interviews with people in uh, Greater Peter Maritzburg area, I'll show you a map a little later and point out where that is, um, just inland from Durban, um, when I was working with people in support groups, and I also worked with one male-only uh, support group and with some pretty strong male leaders in the community, um, one of the things that became really evident was the central importance of children in people's lives. Most of the people living with HIV these days um, are of reproductive age, um, and roughly, certainly in KwaZulu-Natal, where I do my work, roughly one in four people are infected with HIV, and most of those are of reproductive age. So it's a really important issue for people to begin, for us to begin to address the issue of, of having children and how to have children safely. So I started kind of doing this work on that basis, and then I've gotten drawn into very similar projects in Uganda, Malawi, and as well in Los Angeles. Um, we really are at the beginning stages of trying to figure this out. Um, it has not been systematically addressed. There's a researcher at Columbia University who's been doing some work with men with HIV for a while, and there are, there's more work being done in Europe just because people can be covered under public health systems there to be covered for this kind of stuff. But I'll walk you through the South African context and some of the situations that I've experienced there uh, and learned from people there. So just to acknowledge, this research was funded, funded through the UCLA Center for AIDS Research and the UC Global Health Institute's NIH Fogarty Fellowship in Women's Health and Empowerment. The first phase of my research on client perspectives I conducted with Dr. Jenny Smith and her team at MATCH uh, in Durban, which is affiliated with the University of Witwatersrand. And the second phase interviewing providers was conducted with Dr. Pranitha Maharaj at the Development Studies uh, Center at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Um, just briefly, the two phases. We, phase one, we conducted research at an ARV clinic in Wentworth, um, and another one at Don McKenzie Hospital, and the IRB approvals are there. We did 43 in-depth qualitative interviews, 22 men, 21 women. The provider perspectives, we worked at Don McKenzie and at McCord Hospital. Um, and the collaborators are there, Dr. Steve Carpenter, Don McKenzie, and Dr. Tamarin Crankshaw at McCord Hospital were important partners in that phase of the work. And we did 12 in-depth qualitative interviews with two focus groups at those sites. Um, so, let me see if I can get the pointer to work. I don't even... Yeah. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. So, uh, this here is Wentworth Hospital. This is Durban Central. Um, and then over here is Don McKenzie, which is much more urban. It's uh, right in the city environs. And then this is where, um, not Don McKenzie, sorry, this is McCord. And then this is where Don McKenzie is. Uh, in the Valley of a Thousand Hills. And you'll see here, this gives you a map of the um, Eteguini Municipal Health System, which is Greater Durban, is Eteguini. Um, that is um, Wentworth Hospital, that is McCord, and this is um, Don McKenzie Hospital. And the, the blue H's are hospitals, the red crosses are all clinics, so you can kind of see the the kind of concentration along the coastal belt of a lot of services, but as you move inland, there are fewer services. So this is um, one of the wings at Wentworth Hospital, their wellness center. Uh, Wentworth serves a low-income, diverse racial population, though predominantly African. South Africa is about 87% African population. 
and um, they have a wellness clinic for people who are not yet on antiretroviral medication but who have HIV. They also have a male circumcision project and they were in the process of planning a full service family planning clinic that would also service people with HIV. Don McKenzie Hospital um, inland is in this area in uh, the Valley of a Thousand Hills. It's 45 kilometers outside of Durban. It's, all of these are part of the Department of Health system. This largely serves a low-income rural African community. I saw one non-African in the time that I was doing my research there, and they have three down referral clinics. For me, what's interesting as an anthropologist is this is an area rich in, ethnic, in a history of ethnographic research conducted by Eileen Krecher, Absalom Vilakazi, and Harriet Ngubane in this area. And Harriet Ngubane's work, if you're interested in South African health, is really an important seminal work. And then McCord Hospital started out as a mission hospital. It's right in the city center, and it serves a very diverse economic and racial population. Uh, they, I have to, at this point, at the time we did research, they had full services, PMTCT, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission Services, an antiretroviral clinic, and male circumcision services. Unfortunately, they lost their CDC funding and all of their HIV services have been discontinued. So that's a very, very sad issue. Anyone wants to talk to me about that, I can talk afterward, but I won't talk about it now. All right, so with clients, what we looked at is uh, their fertility desires and intentions, their views on conception and birth, their experiences with healthcare providers, the availability of reproductive health services for people living with HIV, and their knowledge or views of strategies to ensure safe conception, in particular of assisted insemination, sperm washing, and harm reduction approaches, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we asked them questions about that. Um, with providers, we focused on their views on delivering reproductive health services for people with HIV, meeting the needs of the men and women that they serve, the feasibility of providing culturally appropriate reproductive health services, and the challenges in the current healthcare delivery system to actually providing these services and what their training needs would be as providers. So let me explain a little bit about um, the methods that we talk to them about um, for a safer conception. In the case of seroconcordant couples where both partners are HIV positive, what's generally recommended is that they are put on heart, highly active antiretroviral treatment, that their health status is managed, that they are watched for any STDs, STIs, etc. In other words, get them into a good health situation. Also getting them onto the right antiretroviral regimens because certain antiretrovirals will cause birth defects and certain antiretrovirals will also impact fertility. Um, and then they are counseled to do timed intercourse. And with timed intercourse, what couples are told is that once you're healthy, you can have unprotected sex only during the period of a woman's ovulation. Um, and the rest of the time, you, you would use a condom. And a lot of this is informed by, I think it was the HPTN 052 study, HIV Prevention Trial Network study. Uh, that followed zero discordant couples um, over a number of years in eight different countries. And the findings of that study was that if people were on antiretrovirals and managed their healthcare managed, the rate of transmission to a zero negative partner was only 4%. So this is really informing a lot of safer conception counseling is if you get people into good health, the chances of them transmitting the virus in, in the course of um, their relationship is, is minimized. Of course, in that study, they were encouraged to use condoms all the time. They didn't necessarily use condoms all the time, but they were encouraged to do so. Um, for serodiscordant couples in which the male is HIV positive, um, again, heart is recommended, managing health status, checking viral loads, etc. And then they can use sperm washing um, for the male where he would be asked to give a sperm sample at a clinic. And then that sample would be centrifuged. And usually um, 
the, the sperm will not carry HIV, it's in the seminal fluid, so once they centrifuge, they can then take the cleaned sperm sample and do um, uh, intrauterine insemination of the female. So this one really requires a lot more services. One of the big challenges in all of our work in different settings is how to ensure that you not, it's not so much the centrifuging itself, but creating a whole separate lab because you would have contaminated HIV samples. And so you need to have entirely separate labs and that's the big challenge. Um, certainly not generally available in, in resource poor settings, but even difficult to get here. And even in the US, it wasn't until two or three years ago in California that you could legally inseminate a woman with, with a sperm sample from an HIV positive man. So it, it's also very recent here to address these issues. For serodiscordant couples in which the female is positive, that's a lot easier and couples can actually be even counseled to do self-insemination at home. In this instance, um, if they were going to do self-insemination at home, which is most viable in low resource settings, one would recommend that they use a condom that does not have spermicide. Um, during sex, they would have to watch the ovulation period when the woman is ovulating. After having sex, the man would remove the condom and then take a syringe and pull up the sperm sample and then put it inside the woman's vagina. Um, it would also ideally be done in a clinic setting, but in low resource settings, that's more, probably more feasible. So that's just to give you a background. I'm not going to go into PEP and PrEP, post-exposure or pre-exposure prophylaxis. The, it is being considered. There's some contro controversy around using that method. Anyone who wants to talk about it, I can talk about that after the lecture. All right, so there's been a lot of research um, in recent years starting to show that people living with HIV really want to have children. Cooper is, i just taken a few examples here. Cooper's work, she talks about people saying life is still going on and that having children really represents hope and represents normalcy and, and wanting to have children. Bieza Kashesia in Malawi has shown that uh, it's a very important issue in relationships, that partners really want them to have children. And so that's another motivating factor. And Meyer et al. have also shown how ARVs have improved health and therefore increased fertility desires among people. Usually within the initial period of people being diagnosed with HIV, if they're not feeling well, they're usually not thinking about having children. But as soon as you get their health status stabilized and they're doing well, they often will start to express interest in having children. And PMTCT, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission Care, has really increased the chances of having healthy HIV negative babies and therefore increased the desire to have children. So I'm gonna cut straight into our, um, some of our findings with clients. We found that we were asking about PMTCT and how that was impacting. Women generally knew about PMTCT care and the use of nevirapine. Most men did not. This is one of the things that is really centrally important in, in my research is finding that men are just not included. And so men don't know. They don't have the information. And it's a critically important issue. Providers tend to talk to women and not to men. Um, most Clients reported that their partner also wanted a child, uh, and a few had, dis had not discussed the desire for a child with a partner. In most instances, those are likely to be individuals who have not yet disclosed their status. But most had discussed it with a partner. Some women said their husbands make the decision to have children, but in general, most men and women said that both partners were making the decision conjointly. Um, no, not surprising, most had not heard about safe conception procedures. And the sources of safe, safe conception knowledge were quite varied, but probably the most frequently mentioned was TV and radio uh, as sources of information, TV shows and so forth. Um, most of the clients told us that they would like to discuss their desire for a child and for safe conception with a provider. Only a few had actually had those discussions. Most had not had those discussions. And most participants believed that their partners would participate in safer conception counseling if they were asked to come in. 
Um, a few said that their partner would not because they didn't believe in HIV or things like that, or that they were working too far away from where they were living. Can I ask you? Yeah. If you're going to discuss this, I can wait. But yeah, no. I can imagine that the responses to these questions are influenced by whether or not they understand the fate of the child as either HIV positive or free. And right. I, because your last bullet in the last slide talked about that progress we made there, but I yes. imagine that that's a big elephant in the room. Yes. Whether or not so. Yes, we did. We talked about those kinds of issues about, and most often, and something that I, I will come to is, most often, clients their primary concern is ensuring that the child is going to be HIV negative, and most of them knew. Like even the men who said that they didn't know about PMTCT, like they didn't have the knowledge of how it worked. They had heard that it was available. And they knew that if their partners got pregnant, that their partners should come in for care, and then they would get the information. But the men didn't know what would be done or how it would be done. Uh, they just knew that women needed to go in to see the doctor if they were pregnant. So yes, there's a very strong awareness of that and a very great concern on the part of clients and providers around those issues. So I'm going to try, I'm probably not going to have time to go through all of them. I'll do my best. I'll keep an eye on the time. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a flavor of things that people told us. So in talking about the desire for a child, one of the respondents told us, we asked, can you share with me the issues that concern you or have concerned you about trying to make a decision to have a child? And this respondent said, I need to have children because I'm married. Another thing, I'm still young, so I need a family because I got a house, I got a husband, so I need to have children. So it doesn't make you not want to have a baby because you are HIV positive. You see, the problem, the problem is, on my side, I never had children at all in my life. And another thing, I got everything, you know, she repeats it, a house, a husband, and I'm working. So I'm self-employed, so I'm doing my own work, and where I'm doing my business is fine, so I need to get a partner, a child, a family to talk to, someone in the house when my husband is not in. My husband has gone to work. Because my husband is working in Joburg, Johannesburg is inland from Durban, and he leaves me alone in the house, so I need a child. And then she uh, broke down and started crying. Now, this is an issue that comes up all the time for people, that they really feel very, that it's very important, that it's a very next important stage in their lives, that they need to have children. We also find that if people are in new relationships, if a partner has died and they're now in a new relationship, or a relationship just ended and they're in a new relationship, even if they already have some children, they want to have a child with this partner. Now, in some settings, that's more important than in others. South Africa, it's important. It ca women can still negotiate that kind of issue with a partner. But securing a partner in South Africa becomes really important because South Africa has very, this is a paper I wrote, um, I think it was published in 2010, uh, about couples looking to the future and wanting to have children. And one of the drivers in South Africa is South Africa has very low marriage rates. Roughly one third of people in South Africa will ever be married in their lifetime. And the age of marriage, I forget it exactly. Um, I've got a reference later to Moultrie and Hosford's study. Um, I think it's about 32 for women and 34 for men. So it's a very late age of marriage. So trying to secure relationships is really important. And children, in the absence of marriage, is one of my theories that I put forward in my paper, Looking to the Future. Children become a means of securing a relationship, of saying, this is a committed relationship. We are in this together. Um, so this is a pretty important issue, very important in some other African settings as well. So I want to share with you some of the things they had to say with us about the different procedures. We talked to them about insemination. We would describe carefully. We would first ask, have you heard of anything that can be done to prevent transmission? Most of them said no. Then we would ask, have you, do you know how to prevent transmission when the man is positive and the woman is negative? Um, and um, sorry, in this instance, when, when the woman is positive and the man is negative, and then, if they didn't know anything, we'd describe the procedure to them. And um, 
This is what one of the women said to us after hearing about it. She said, if I use this strategy, my partner will not blame me that I infected him. He will not complain. He will know that when we will have sex, we will use condoms. For a child, we will use this strategy. Another respondent told us, wow, I don't know, I'm shocked. I never thought that something like this would happen. I never knew. Now that I know, I will speak to the man. I will tell him that I would have heard new things today. And she went on, I think that it will help, for an HIV positive woman, I think it will help her to conceive a healthy child. And she can also be protected from spreading the disease. Because during the time you have unprotected sex because of wanting to conceive a child, that is another problem. And couples would talk to us about wanting to have children and then choosing to have unprotected sex, not telling providers about it. Because providers consistently tell them to use condoms. Um, so she was very pleased. We had one respondent, for example, who had not disclosed her status to her partner. There may have been others as well who, who did this. And she then later came back to our, uh, our team and said, oh, after you told me about this, I went and told my husband that I'm positive and now we can come in and see the doctor and we can try to get help so we can have children. So. Being able to say to your partner, OK, I am positive, but we can still have children safely, enabled her to disclose her status. Talking about sperm washing, um, the one respondent told us it could also help him because he will not have the stress that he cannot have a child. He will know that there is an appropriate way of having a child, and also it can help him. If, say, I am positive or my partner is positive and I am negative, he can be able to have a relationship with a negative person and use protection. And when they want to have a child, they can use this procedure. This is a pretty critically important issue because what a lot of people are doing is they're serosorting. They're trying to find partners who are HIV positive. So they don't have to deal with this issue of what if I've got a negative partner and I want to have a child. Um, and people are not disclosing to negative partners because they're afraid of the partner leaving them because then they can't have a child. Uh, so being able to bring these services and say to people, we can actually provide these needs, might then um, be less of a deterrent in terms of having a negative partner and having children with a negative partner. Um, and another respondent said, it all amazes me. I never knew about it because I heard about this for the first time today, but I can see that technology is expanding. It would be better if this continues. I don't know how to explain it, but another thing, I am thankful to the researchers for teaching this, us this. I am happy. And she said that the, her and her partner would consider using it. And with respect to timed intercourse, what's interesting is most of the research right now in resource-poor settings is leaning towards recommending timed intercourse as being the most viable in resource-poor settings. But interestingly, a number of our respondents were not terribly comfortable with the idea of timed intercourse. So um, the, one of the respondents told us, my problem is that you can't trust it. Let's say you're going to have sex, isn't it? Let's say you get hurt and you're positive and you're having sex. I think you do get infected in that way. And similarly, uh, the other person there were another person that we spoke to said, uh, when we described this procedure, it will not help them. Uh, and would you use this with your partner? No. And why? Because it is something that is not safe. So one of the things that concerned them was that there is potential risk. We don't yet know. The studies haven't yet been done for us to be able to say, look, chances are if you can ro enroll people and get them in care, we're probably going to have extremely low risk of transmission if people follow guidelines. But for the moment, we can't make that promise to people um, because we just don't have the studies to support it. Um, but people are concerned about the level of risk of infection. One of the interesting things is I was concerned in this research about what male views would be around um, using these uh, procedures that would require some kind of intervention and whether they would agree. And it was very interesting. Men did say that they preferred what they referred to as live sex. Um, and sometimes that's referring, live sex is referring to sex without condoms. And so in this instance, uh, women generally believe that their partners would prefer the time intercourse option because they could have sex without a condom. The challenge they thought would be whether men would then continue to use condoms outside of the ovulation period. 
Um, but men, interestingly, told us that we're more willing to accept these, accept these assisted conception services when they were driven by concerns about having children, which trumped concerns related to sex. And a few men told us things like, you know, when I want to make love to my partner, I will have sex with her. But when I want to have a child, then I will use these methods. So they were kind of making this distinction between sex and reproduction. If I want to make love to her, okay, I can use my condom and I can, have, I can make love to her and have sex with her. But if I have to use these other procedures, I would consider them so long as they can help me and my partner have a child safely and ensure that the child is well and that we can live. One of the things that men and women express concern about is that they too, not only that their child should be negative, but that they too could live healthy lives and be around to actually raise their own children uh, and impart their own values. Um, and in the absence of safe conception options, what clients were generally telling us was, well, you know, we'll have to have unprotected sex and it's going to be up to God, we're just going to leave it up to God, um, is what people would tell us. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but in discussions with providers, some of them had had discussions. Uh, here is a woman who talked about having to choose the right treatment so that there wouldn't be any birth defects. Um, here is one who talks about how the provider tried to discourage her from having children, saying that maybe you, want, you can have a child that maybe won't be, be able to see properly, maybe the child won't hear, maybe the child will be a crip, meaning disabled. Um, and the, you know, this is where she also invokes this notion that whatever God gives us, as long as we got something in our hands. Um, and then the provider had told her that he referred her to a hospital for care, for fertility service care, but had told her that, we, that they shouldn't be having a baby because they're not well enough yet. And when I talk about providers, providers talk about this issue too of trying to get people to delay uh, having children. Uh, so in their discussions with providers, they also talked about uh, that they needed to come with partners and that providers would, were trying to encourage them to come with partners. Um, and again here, reflecting what we saw earlier, I would like to have a child because I, I only have one child. Now let me shift into looking at the providers. So here we found that they talked about that it's mostly women that they're seeing, no big surprise. McCord Hospital, which was more urban, did have um, more men coming in and making inquiries, and generally speaking, men were more comfortable going to urban settings away from home. They didn't like going to clinics near their own homes. Um, providers talk about how patients come in pre pregnant and tell them that the condom broke, that they're not seeking preconception counseling. Um, providers also mention that they discourage pat patients because of their concerns about the health risks to the patient. Um, they did talk about the awareness of patients' rights to make childbearing decisions, but often provider attitudes at the, s the same providers who might acknowledge that uh, clients have the right to make this choice would also then often express very negative attitudes about people with HIV having children. So there was kind of a conflict, and we found it was primarily nurses who were likely to exp express these conflictual views. Um, all of the providers at every level needed training in safer conception counseling. Um, they mentioned a lot of problems with referrals and the integration of services like McCord Hospital where all these services are provided, but from one clinic to another, like from the PMTCT clinic to the ARV clinic, they don't know what's being recommended in those different settings or whether clients are actually going for the PMTCT care. So the follow-up issue is a real problem. Um, patients do sometimes come with partners, but most often not. McCord was more likely to have that. Disclosure issues, which I'll hopefully get to a few slides on, uh, were a big uh, problem here. Um, and then patients, they reported, were hearing about safer conception through the media, through TV and radio. So the providers, one of the issues that their training really emphasizes that people with HIV should not have children, and they talk about that. So here this provider tells us, we used to be told before, maybe three to four years ago, 
in our worship that we must not encourage them by telling them they can fall pregnant as long as their viral load is suppressed. So we're not encouraged to tell them that you can. Only advise both parties that they must come at least once a month to the clinic preparing to get pregnant to monitor the viral load and the CD4 count. And we had clients who would tell us this, how, how providers had counseled them in this way, but the providers are using it as a delaying tactic and they're never actually getting to talk to them about, okay, so now you can have children and this is what you need to do. And so then clients report just giving up on the providers and just having unprotected sex. Some of the providers talked about the irresponsibility of clients. They can't afford it. Um, they're sick and they want another one. It's sad because the last child cannot be healthy and is going to be rejected. She won't even have time for three of them. So they're making a lot of judgments about how many children these people have, what their financial status is, and um, whether they're going to be well enough to be around to raise these children. They will make their own decision at the end of the day. You cannot force them. They have rights. And the worst part, the child support grant has increased. They want to have child, children. This is a welfare grant system in South Africa for children. They just think about the money. They don't care about their health. So that's one set of views. And oftentimes, you know, there's this kind of contradic contradictory kind of um, set of views about, well, they have the right, but they're irresponsible and they shouldn't do it. And then some of them talking more about trying to balance the rights with the cultural imperatives to have children and with health risks. So one provider told us it depends because it's a if it's a first baby, you cannot say don't fall pregnant. And sometimes it's difficult when the woman has about three children. In that case, you're supposed to say no. You already have these children. Why do you want to have more? But it's up to her to decide, really, because you cannot decide for anyone. But from my point of view, I cannot have a child whilst I already have two. No matter now there are drugs, I don't know. It's not nice. And another provider said, it comes to the decision of the parent because we, as counselors, we were not taught to decide. What we do is to give facts, and we ask those questions. What is the reason for you to have a child? And how many children do you have? Why now? Then a client is able to tell you their story, but we can't judge and we cannot say you can't, but we give options and make sure that the patient is given all the information she needs. So we kind of have this back and forth, people who are like, okay, we can just provide information, then the provider has to make, then the client has to make the decision. And yet, on the other hand, people saying, well, yes, they should, but no, if they have too many children, no, they shouldn't, and, and bringing in their own personal views and personal experiences in terms of trying to make those judgment calls. Clients did, I mean, providers did talk about uh, couples counseling with clients and trying to encourage partners to come in. Um, here this provider talks about talking to the partner and saying that his viral load must be low and his partner must always get checked whether she is positive or not and they must come to the clinic so that we can discuss. So, you know, encouraging them to come in together so that the provider can really assist them and follow both of their health status. The disclosure issues was one of the biggest concerns that um, providers felt they just had no skills for dealing with. So here we have three different um, I'm sorry, no, this is one counselor. I have another one, I think, coming up. So here, the, counsel, the first counselor says, we have, uh, it's very difficult, especially when the female partner has tested positive and she went home and disclosed to her male partner. You encourage the male partner to bring, the female partner to bring the male, but when the male partner comes to the clinic and tests negative, that's a big issue. It can even lead to divorce. We have a patient who's in the process of being divorced because her partner tested negative and she tested positive. So we're dealing with discordant couples and it's a problem. And we really need help, we need training. Another counselor raised the same issue, talking about a woman who came in and she had lost a partner because, um, because of the fact that her partner tested negative and she was positive. She then got married to a new partner and she did not want to tell this guy. So she says, then she met this new guy and fell pregnant. She said she will never disclose her status because the last time she disclosed her status and the partner divorced her. 
And this same councillor as the first one said, the reason why this is such a big issue is, oh, there's so much competition, it's too high, my dear. You disclose your status and then you will be left behind. So this kind of relates to the South African situation with very low marriage rates, that people are afraid of losing partners if they disclose their status. Um, and providers are really just not in a position to try to assist people in these disclosure issues. So it's a major issue that if we're going to provide safer conception counseling, what do we do in instances where people are not comfortable disclosing to their partners? And there are options we have available where we can treat just the one individual, but there would still be a measure of risk which really raises the issues of liability for providers of, of providing service in that way. Um, some did talk about doing some safer conception counseling. So here's a nurse who talked about counseling about the ovulation period, about time intercourse, when to use a condom, when not to, and about viral loads and so forth. And another nurse who said, patients in the it's hard because patients at the clinic are being seen by different people. So the person you see today in the next month, you don't know what happened. So this gets back to the kind of integration and referral and those kinds of things. This is even within one clinic. They will come in and month to month they'll be seeing different providers. And although some records are kept, there's not always, because they're seeing so many clients, there's not always careful follow-up from whatever was in the record. So one provider may raise the issue, but then the next provider may move on. The person might have some kind of other health issue that they spend their time talking about, and then don't go back and say, oh, I see you spoke to Dr. So-and-so about wanting to have a child. So that follow-up really is not happening. So I'm, gonna, I'm getting to the point of summarizing now so that you'd have a chance to ask a few questions. What's interesting is we found points of agreement between clients and providers. They tended to agree on the rights of HIV positive people to choose to have children. They tended to agree that men will reject sperm donation. Men did report that to us, but will accept use of their own sperm for IVF. Um, there were problems of disclosure to the partner with unknown status or HIV negative status, especially in the case of women. And they were all, both providers and clients, concerned to protect the child from HIV. So I think these are useful points to begin to think about how do you provide safer conception counseling if you think that these are the common points of interest between providers and clients. So clearly both providers and clients need to have this issue of disclosure addressed and have proper services to en enable disclosure or to address ways in which to serve needs in the failure to disclose status. And uh, with respect to um, IVF, men will consider it, even though they don't love the idea, they will consider it if they really want to have children. The challenges are that providers have inadequate knowledge and training. That's not too big of a challenge. It just means we need to put in place proper training, and we need to be able to um, kind of address older ways in which providers have been trained to think. Um, a much bigger problem to address is that reproductive health services are targeted to women. How are we going to include men, not only as partners, but as the primary client? Because at times we will have HIV positive men who have negative female partners. So how do we include them in reproductive health care? And this is a huge issue, a huge barrier. And I can talk more about that uh, outside the lecture as well. Uh, the follow-up and integration of services that, we, that I've been talking about. Another piece that is a training piece that needs to address, be addressed is the judgmental attitudes of providers, and it seems particularly of nurses that needs to be addressed. And then how to serve serious cordon couples with these issues of disclosure and anger and divorce and fear. And I mentioned, this is where I have the mention of um, the Maltry and Hosegood, which was 2010, it was published. And then Mark Hunter's ethnography, Love in a Time of AIDS, published in 2010, is also a wonderful piece of ethnographic work for really understanding the complexity of relational dynamics 
um, and of how people are trying to deal with these issues in the context of developing loving relationships. So my recommendations would be that we need provider training in non-judgmental safe conception counseling. We need training for providers to counsel serodiscordant couples. One of the things that needs to happen is there needs to be more routine questioning regarding HIV positive patients, childbearing desires, their relationship status, whether their relationship has changed, if they're in a new one or an old one, and their partner desires. Asking both men and women and encourage them to bring partners in when they're starting to discuss childbearing desires and intentions. South Africa luckily has a leap ahead of most other countries. It's one of the few countries, if not one of the only countries, certainly one of the only African countries, but even the US, doesn't have safer conception guidelines. South Africa does. They were published by Becker et al. in 2011. Um, and that's a really wonderful leap forward for South Africa that we already have those. And there are many other settings in which they're referencing the South African guidelines, but guidelines need to be set up specific to specific countries and what kinds of drug regimens are available and what is appropriate in that context. So I'm going to end it there. There's a lot more I could talk about and I'm happy to take a few questions.